An exceptionally loud and warm welcome to our new speakers, Roger Antonson, <laughs> Megan Berman, <laughs> and Boris Levitt. <laughs> and now to speak about the Green Briar Ghost, please welcome Beth Abdallah. Hey, everybody. <laughs> okay, this one is crazy pants, super juicy, awesome, so I'm just going to jump right in. On January 22nd of 1897 in Lewisburg, West Virginia, the dashing new blacksmith in town by the name of Trout Shoe stopped by the home of... Yeah, really? This, seriously, Trout? Nobody knows where he got that name. Um, he stopped by the home of an African-American woman in the village who everybody knew as Aunt Martha Jones and asked her if her uh, son Andy would stop by his house to help his wife Zona with some chores. Zona had been sick, and she'd been under the care of the local physician, Dr. George W. Knapp, and... Shu stopped by the Jones home three times that day, looking for Andy, becoming increasingly agitated, demanding that he go to his home to help his wife. Trout had arrived in town the previous year under the auspices of beginning a new life. Nobody knew much about him except that he seemed to have a checkered past, as did Zona, who the year before had given birth to an illegitimate child with a different man. So the two of them were both kind of looked down upon by their communities, but her mother was very insistent that she stay away from this man. She didn't trust him. But after a very brief courtship, the two wed on October 20th of 1896 and moved into this house. And then sometime in December, Zona became ill, and some people speculate that she may have been in the early stages of pregnancy. Uh, so finally, Shu was able to track Andy down, sent him to the house, and when Andy got there, there was no answer at the door, so he let himself in, and that's when he found the body of Zona Shu stretched out on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. And she looked like she'd been placed there. Her feet were together, one arm was cast to the side, the other was across her body, and her head was gently tilted to one side. And her eyes were wide open, and Andy immediately knew that this white lady was dead. So, because Andy was African American. So, he ran home, told his mother, his mother ran to find Dr. Knapp, and then Andy ran to the blacksmith shop to find Trout. And by the time Dr. Knapp got to the shoe home, in a complete breach of etiquette at the time, Shu had already bathed and redressed the body of his wife in a very high and stiff-necked collared dress and had placed her on the bed. And Dr. Knapp attempted to do a cursory examination, but Shu was so grief-stricken that he couldn't bear the doctor touching the body of his wife. So after a while, the doctor just said, okay, it must be a case of everlasting faint, which is what they would have called a heart attack or a stroke or an aneurysm or something like that back then. And then later, he changed the cause of death to childbirth, which, again, leads us to believe that she was pregnant at the time of her death. She was taken to her parents' home, which was several miles away in the Richlands, a uh, different part of West Virginia. And she was put on display in the family home for the wake. And during the wake... Trout acted really weird. He w w stayed at the head of the casket. He was fussing with pillows, and he had wrapped a big old scarf around her neck. And he's like, oh, I just want her to be warm and comfortable. So after the wake, when everybody's like, he's losing it, they finally took her to the local Methodist church, and she was buried there, and everything seemed to get back to normal for a while, except her mother 
never accepted the whole everlasting faint nonsense. And after a month or so, Mary Jane Heaster showed up at the office of the local prosecutor, the Honorable John Alfred Preston, with the most amazing story. She claimed that for four consecutive nights, the spirit of her daughter had appeared to her and had explained to her that in a fit of rage, because she had not prepared meat for supper, Trout had strangled her and squeezed her neck off at the first joint. And then she said, but I don't know why he was so mad. I mean, I had plenty. I had butter and apple butter and apples and over two or three kinds of jellies and pears and cherries and raspberry jelly. No wonder the guy was pissed off. So then she went on to tell her mother about how Trout had strangled her. And according to the mother, at this point, she walked away from her mother, stopped, and then did her very best Regan McNeil impersonation <laughs> to demonstrate the severity of her injuries. To placate this batshit crazy lady, Preston said, okay, I'll go talk to the doctor and we'll sort this out. But when he got to talk to Dr. Knapp, he realized that the doctor never really did an examination because Trout wouldn't let him near the body. So between Trout's weird behavior and the fact that there was no real examination, they reopened the case, exhumed the body, and did an autopsy. And the following is a quote from the Monroe Watchman newspaper that reported the autopsy's findings. The examination disclosed that the neck was dislocated between the first and second cerebral vertebrae. The ligaments were torn and ruptured, and the windpipe had been crushed in at a point in front of the neck. Based on the circumstantial evidence and Trout Shoe's bonkers behavior, he was arrested and tried for murder on July 1st. Mary Jane was put on the witness stand by the defense. <laughs> they figured if they let the crazy out and let everybody see it, that they would get their client off with, you know, just a slap on the wrist, maybe. But it backfired terribly. And after a week of proceedings and one hour of jury deliberation, Trout Shoe was found guilty of murder on July 8th, 1897, and sentenced to life in prison at the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville. He died there in 1900 during an epidemic that spread through the prison. Uh, some say it was tuberculosis. So by ghosty woo. How many people think that the ghost got her man? Woo. Okay, well, the boozy barrister over at Lawyers and Liquor, which is an awesome blog, has some ideas of his own, and he has some really great points. First of all, you have to keep in mind, 1897, the Civil War was like five minutes ago. And not all of West Virginia was happy about the annexation. And <laughs> Trout's defense attorney, one of his defense attorneys, was the first African-American attorney in Greenbrier County, which probably did not sit well with the good people of Greenbrier. And the people already had a mistrust and dislike of Shu. Um, plus the fact that once he got to, uh, arrested, it came out that he'd been married twice before, that one of his wives had claimed he was abusive, another wife died mysteriously, and so they already had it in for him. In fact, the sheriff had to handcuff him to a deputy and hide him in a cornfield because a lynch mob had formed as they were getting ready to take him from the local jail to the penitentiary. So, based on that additional information, how many people still think that he was guilty? Woo! Okay. Well, Sharon McCrum, 
who is the McBomb, because she has been emailing back and forth with me like crazy because I couldn't get a hold of her book in time. And she's been sending me all sorts of awesome information and pictures like this picture of the shoe house as it looks today. And this portrait of the lead defense attorney's family, that's William Rucker with the magnificent beard. According to McCrum, Extensive research over three years brought up some fascinating details. She had spoken with Shu's living relatives who said when his second wife died, he was at a logging camp miles and miles away. He had nothing to do with her death, even though people said he dropped a brick on her head. But he didn't. She fell off a ladder. Also, this is a drawing that the Greenbrier Historical Society sent me that Shu did in prison. And it shows himself and Zona standing. And then if you can see in the back, you can see his second wife in a coffin. She also learned that there was actually a connection between Mary Jane Heaster and another case that had taken place in England in 1827 with another finger-pointing ghost. So, the plot thickens. And then there's little Andy Jones, who everybody said was a little kid of like 11 years old, but it turns out he was actually a cognitively disabled 19-year-old who probably had the mental age of an 11-year-old. And there were some who thought that maybe he did it. In fact, his own mother was kind of worried that he may have done it. So now, who still thinks that she was guilty? Woo! Okay, well, Sharon McCrum believes that she figured out the truth. And for you to know the truth, you're going to have to read her book. So with that, I would like to raise our glasses to the researchers who do all the heavy lifting. And I want to thank Sharon in particular. Sharon, if you're watching this video later, that cake you requested with the file in it, it's in the mail. Thanks. <laughs>